The challenge for this lecture is to contextualize Paradise by Toni Morris, which is a complex, <laughs> to say the least, but which also, if you know how to look for them, gives all kinds of little nuggets, historical nuggets, mm -hmm. that mean you've got to go back and do research. You've got to, what is this? What is this? Um, and she just totally takes you into all of these different, the mindsets of all these different people without any context whatsoever, without any, this is just this person, so you were meeting them in a cafeteria and, and knew nothing, you know, absolutely nothing about them. So, um, what I want to do is to give you kind of <clears throat> um, a background to make our seminar uh, this afternoon and also on Thursday have um, more bite to it. And that means I'm going to talk about three different things, okay, which are um, We're going to look at the, the issue of resistance, accommodationism, and the quest to join the nation, and the black towns of the West, of certain Western states, like Kansas, like Nebraska, but especially Oklahoma, as a kind of mixture of both accommodationism and resistance. That's the first point that we're going to talk about. The second one being uh, the issue of talismanic color blindness, and I'm going to define that because she's challenging talismanic color blindness, and I want you to, we want to talk about that with Jeff this afternoon. And we're, if I have time, but definitely we will get to it sometime, the whole problem of gender in the historical black communities, and especially as it, the issue of gender relates to um, the role of the church, the role of the church traditionally in the African American community. So those are the broad themes, okay? They're in your syllabus if you want to go back and, and look at those three points, did I really get the ideas for these three categories that are listed under lecture themes for the week, and then if not, you know, you can raise questions or whatever. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about is this question of the development of the black towns. Because so few people know about these black towns. And I would like to be able to tell you that the reason why I know about the development of black towns is because my dad came from one, but that's not even how I am learned really to understand about these black towns. And, and that is because of um, um, a film I saw, which I... Um, on one hand, really wanted to get for you, but I'm, because it's at Seattle Central Community College and I haven't lost hope, but a film about the Tulsa race riot of 1921, which she talks about in her book. Okay. <clears throat> and Tulsa, that Tulsa race riot uh, in Oklahoma, uh, in early part of Oklahoma history, is really important because it signaled the beginning of um, the attack on the commercial and economic power that blacks who left the South to go West will have been amassing in certain towns of the West. All right? And uh, one of your books that we're going to read later on um, about uh, this same period, written by Ida B. Wells. One of those books says that lynching and its emergence, and roughly that coincides with that famous period of birth of a nation and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan we went through last week, lynching 
and I'm going to define lynching. And these race riots. That is the hanging by the throat of black men and women. Black men and women. Um, that takes place starting in about 1880 and goes all the way up the last known case of lynching so-called is like 1956. But what happened in the last decade in Oregon to that Ethiopian immigrant, some people consider as a lynching as well. That is, and here's a lynching, when a crowd of um, whites gets together and, um, and hang, kills in a group, a single black person or maybe two, right? For some kind of reason, and people stand to watch. That is, I think that's the classic definition of a lynching. Almost all of the lynches took place in this period of 1880 to 1935-40, roughly. That's, or nine, especially since 1930. That's when they end. The um, genitalia, that is the penis, scrotum, parts of men, uh, male, uh, male genitalia, reproductive system, were often the target, sometimes sliced off, stuffed in, stuffed in the mouth, and so on. We have on this campus, though, um, an interesting person who works in the mail room, Jimmy Lowe, whose family, I mean, he could, provided me with a list of all of the people known to have been lynched that he got off the net because he was interested because he comes from one of those towns that, you know, black people used to joke about called Lynch and Quick, Mississippi, or Lynch and Quick, Hang em High, Georgia, whatever. But he comes from a town uh, where he lost an aunt and two children for being sassy. Same name, L-O-W-E. It's on that list of people lynched. Okay. So lynching is also one of these things that, gee, where have I heard about lynching in my History 101 class that I had in high school or college? Right? Not there. Part of the denial that has fed this historical colorblindness about American history. Now, Ida B. Wells' point that you will see, one of her points in her book that I think is very interesting, is that sex might have been, or the fear of, of protection of white womanhood, remember that film last, <coughs> the film last week, might have been the overtext, but the subtext was economic power in almost every, or in the vast majority of the religions. That's one of the pieces of her book that I think is the most valuable. And we will see that coming up. So definitely that was the case of Tulsa, Oklahoma. The riot at Tulsa. And I'm still going to try to get some of these, um, to see if I can get this video for um, tomorrow. Um, I was having difficulty observing it. Let me just write that down. Oh God. Can I borrow your pencil for a second? Same as we'll look here to do. Check. Tulsa. Um, <clears throat> so Tulsa was one of those Towns where, in fact, at the turn of the century, how did Tulsa become a city where the most powerful population that owned banks, that actually controlled a lot of the economy of the town, were black people at the turn of the century? And how come there's no town like that anywhere in the country today? That's an interesting question. So we have to go back to the people who were known, at least in the state of Kansas, by this term. Okay, now everybody knows the whole question of Exodus in the Bible, the Jews, da 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 da, right? And the whole issue of going someplace to seek a space in place where 
home can be what do you get called home. And of course, black people being very tied to the church, um, the central organization of community, often the church, hmm? then this uh, does come from the Bible. And exodus refers to those people who migrated from the south to um, the west, certain western states, in this case mostly Kansas. The word exodus just refers to Kansas. But Tony Morrison's book refers to Oklahoma. And what this means is that they founded towns between, eight, you know, there were two great migrations of black people. There was an industrial, one that led and was related to the Industrial Revolution. This great migration after uh, the Civil War, after, after uh, Reconstruction. Remember we were talking about Reconstruction that period from 1867? That little door that's open like that? Gone, closed, right? Because right after 1877 with the rise of the Klan, the development of the Black Codes, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson that says separate but equal is constitutional and represents, you know, the, the state of the land, right? Once that door closed and all of these black codes, these laws that institutionalized segregation got put into place, then there were these two waves of migration. One to the north, to big cities, like Chicago especially like Detroit, like New York, hmm? Washington, D.C., which was sort of south anyway, right? And then there was another wave moving uh, <clears throat> that, that in a way was reflected in uh, uh, earlier migration patterns to the west, okay, to Kansas, to Oklahoma, to the territory. Now, don't forget, Oklahoma does not become a state until 1912. It doesn't become a, a, a state. It's a territory. Which means that um, even though there may have been kind of um, manifest destiny kind of designs on the territory, you could call them pre-state, Right, because they were on their way to becoming states, it was clear. But they were territories for a long time. Certainly, Oklahoma was one of those places. Now, Oklahoma, and I'm going to try to do this interesting conjunction because I want to tell you about my family and how it fits, because I think it'll help you also with the workshop and how you think about writing. Um, but Oklahoma was interesting not just in terms of my own personal family, but just because of these black towns that coexisted right next to Indian towns, right next to white towns. The interesting thing about this is that in Mexico also, there were places where runaway slaves created towns, and the towns that had, where everyone was mixed, were kind of like mestizo towns. And they coexisted with um, with Indian towns that would be right over the ridge, and you had all these different towns, you know, of so, with this different ethnic identity, not just in Mexico, which is very interesting. I did my some field work in Mexico, in one of these towns, um, but also in places like Oklahoma. So my dad was born in Vian. Vianne, Oklahoma, was one of the black towns. You know, she lists um, in the book a whole series of towns, but there were like 50 of these black towns scattered throughout the state of Oklahoma, which meant that everything was run by, they were like usually founded or settled by, sometimes by um, fugitive slaves, sometimes by, um, and it's interesting to see the history just as an interjection, it's interesting to see the history of the, the development of the so-called Old West and how that interfaces with slavery and which states shall be slaves, which should be freed, and all of those other good things that you learned in U.S. History 202. 
as a senior in high school, right? Um, the relationship between slavery and the quote-unquote uh, settlement patterns of the so-called Old West. Okay? That's a very interesting subject, and in fact, the, the University of Oklahoma Press is, is one of the presses that does do interesting revisiting to these historical issues, um, including, you know, uh, histories of the black cowboys, you know, all these other kinds of themes that have been very slow to get into the mass narrative, okay? So he was born in, in um, uh, Vianne in a black town, um, but <clears throat> um, where there were certain interlocking relationships with Indian town. So just like there's this black horse, this figure named Black Horse in, the, uh, in Paradise, you know, the people who were all these different ethnic groups had these relationships, um, traveled to and from their towns for trade or whatever, but it's just that who ran it, who were the figures of authority in those towns depended upon their ethnicity. How many of you have ever heard of this? But I mean, it's just a very hidden part of U.S. history. Um, one of the things that was very interesting about, in the case of my father's mother, remember when I mentioned this slave owner who wouldn't give his son his freedom, and that that uh, son walked to the north to fight in the Civil War on the side. Once he, this father died, the uncle to whom he had been given as a gift, huh? uh, as a package to, uh, so that the, he could be both close to the father who couldn't bear to part with him, but also not get his freedom, right? And then after this one died, the uncle gives him the freedom and he walks to the, the north and um, uh, to fight in the Civil War. And he marries someone who was somehow connected to this trail of tears, this, ex this expulsion of uh, Indians, especially Creeks, from Georgia who end up in Oklahoma. Remember we said when we were talking about the uh, Florida and the Seminoles and how the Seminoles were a, a group of one expelled, that is, from internal creek battles, expelled to Florida at the turn of the 18th uh, century. And another group, of course, Andrew Jackson, one of his victories when he goes to Florida, when he pushes then, you know, that the Indians have to be controlled, right? And that the fact that there could be runaway slaves moving from Georgia to, and to join a, an exiled Creek faction in Florida, this has got to end. And so Andrew Jackson was instrumental in the Trail of Tears, which is the expulsion of Indians to so, uh, who were in the South in certain slaveholding areas to certain places, and Oklahoma was one of those places. Okay? So, all I know about my father's mother's uh, mother was that somehow she got a lot, she had a lot of land that um, was connected to. Um, but you know how family folklore gets very vague and certain of these things. But how I learned, how I remember that is that I thought it was so awful that my father's father could sell his wife's land, totally take control of it because she had married him. And she had a lot of land in Oklahoma. And I remember Part of it, because as a child, as a teenager, I, we had to go, there was a, my, my father and his sisters were fighting over the last piece of this land. We knew it had oil on it, but nobody wanted to, we were either going to sell it 
or invest everything that everybody owned in trying to buy the rigs and stuff. You know what I mean? And, and my mother was my mother voted against that. Sell it, sell it, sell it. And um, so the family was split. But we went back to Oklahoma, and I saw that land for the last time. This piece that that had been passed down through the when I was around 16, passed down through the generation. So this whole question of of the territory, who owns which land. Um, this is the reason why Oklahoma has the richest Indians today. Because the driest part of the state that had could, could grow nothing was the part that the Indians on this trail of tears, and you know, and the Indians who were there, but especially the Creek, who were near there, all of this Creek territory, Okamulgee is a Creek town, for example. They got this dry, arid barren land, and that's the land that had the most oil, ultimately. So it's in Oklahoma is a very interesting state. And so half of how what I know about it is connected to all this strange history, the folklore, the folklore that got lost because, you know, you don't really, who's the custodian of these after two generations, who cares, kind of. Um, heritage and so on. But it is interesting to then go to read a book like Paradise to see pieces of information that I got not from reading a book about the history of Oklahoma, but from these pieces of my of the folklore that came from my family. And I recommend people trying to do that kind of <coughs> rescue mission before people die, because then you can't go back and get this kind of information, and every single U.S. citizen has interesting stories like that to tell. So, then just to conclude, then, uh, this whole issue of the black town, they were spotted all through Oklahoma, as well as other states. Um, they often were quite successful, and so successful that poor whites could be seduced by um, competing business interests, as was the case in Tulsa in 1921, to then set fire and kill people who um, had, who were amassing capital in, 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 in uh, so-called dangerous ways. All right? How are you following me so far? Have you made these connections? Okay. Um, a lot of these rootless um, whites who, when I say rootless, who didn't have roots or who also were like exodusters only whites, right, coming from uh, um, situations of landlessness. Um, also migrated uh, at about the same time to California, where they were known as Okie. Now, anybody remember that classic film with Henry Fonda called The Grapes of Wrath? John Steinbeck novel, which is about um, poor whites who were really dirt poor. Probably the only movie about poor people that has remained a classic, really, in the mainstream Hollywood narrative. Because the mainstream Hollywood narrative is about people who make it in, in one generation leap all kinds of hurdles to become phenomenally, uh, uh, phenomenally rich, right? Famously rich. Uh, so that's really interesting that John Steinbeck's novel that held that hold over American society. And that's um, also a part of California history as well as Oklahoma history. It was really bad right around the time of the 20s and 30s in Oklahoma, and people were leaving, um, going even further west. One of the interesting people who I managed to meet who was from the same region 
um, well, after I started teaching, was a medicine man from Okamulgee. And one of the things that he, Okamulgee, was a creek town, right? And he was, um, because a lot of the Indians in Oklahoma were creeks. Don't forget this expulsion from the south. It's mostly creek. Um, but there were also Chippewa and Osage and Choctaw. I mean, there were several tribes in Oklahoma. But he was saying, he participated in the Poor People's Campaign, remember? When, right when Martin Luther King is, uh, you know, he's, um, he was, or, right when he was assassinated, he was organizing the Poor People's Campaign in Washington. And, um, poor people came from all over the country to, to sit there. And this man, Clifton Hill, who was an, in, a native, a Creek medicine man, told me that the most, that folklore had it in Oklahoma, and, and, the, and this was reflected in how people, in the poor people's campaign from Oklahoma, treated both, um, black and Indian medicine people from Oklahoma, was that those medicine people who knew African medicine and combined it with Indian medicine were considered especially powerful. And I always thought that was very interesting because it reflected you know, the kind of uneasy coexistence between Indian and black in the state of Oklahoma. That at least at some critical point, that is in the sharing of medicine, they were conjoined. Now, Indian medicine, I, I, I don't want to go off into that, but I recommend everybody read the book American Indian Medicine by an Oklahoman named Virgil Vogel, V-O-G-E-L, um, for a definition of medicine, Indian medicine, that is more thorough than I'm going to give you today. Okay, because I don't want to go there. But medicine is not just medicine in this, let me go to group health sense, but it mixes psychiatry, father, confessor, it's a whole series of things. And uh, when that medicine was mixed with roots work from Africa and African themes, it was seen as being particularly powerful. Morrison also mentions Fort Smith, Arkansas, as one of these places that, and Fort Smith is on the border with Vianne. So if you go to a map and you look up Vianne, Oklahoma, you'll see how close it is to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Um, now, I want to move, if there are no questions on this issue of the black towns, I want to move to um, the question of how Morrison, her approach um, to uh, whiteness and how she sparks an issue um, that is to be reproduced in this particular book that she wrote, but she sparks it amongst a lot of people who, the whole notion of colorblindness. And I recommend people getting this book who are really interested in Toni Morrison, Mazzoni, this one, uh, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness in the Literary Imagination, because it's going to help you understand even further what she's trying to do in this book. Okay. Um, one of the things that she says is that she, in her preface in this book, I was interested as I had been for a long time in the way black people ignite critical moments of discovery or change or emphasis in literature not written by them. Want me to repeat that? I was interested, as I had been for a long time, in the way black people ignite critical moments of discovery or change or emphasis in literature that is not written by them. They are catalytic agents for the discovery of the writer. In fact, I had started casually like a game keeping a file of such instances. And she goes on to talk about some of these. Um, uh, one, one writer, Cardinal, 
who I don't know, um, so I'm not going to go into this. But she has another, she's, she's talking about how these writers use, and of course, uh, the writer last week, also, uh, the myth of Aunt Jemima. She talks about how the black women, women as an image, was so central to the novels by these white women writers, and that some of the stereotyping of these black women writers is because of how white women writers have characterized them. And so um, she says here, the principal reason these matters loom large for me is that I do not have quite the same access to these traditionally useful constructs of blackness. So she's saying that being white, you could construct a black figure or protagonist or character in such a way to represent the fire, the storm, the flight, the war, the birth, the religion, and so on. Sources of imagery. But because, quote unquote, she doesn't say this, I am saying this, because she herself is black, she can't get to that path. She has to go somewhere else. You following me? Now, I'm reading Morrison again. Neither blackness nor, quote unquote, people of color stimulates in me notions of excessive, limitless love, anarchy, or routine dread. I can't rely on these metaphorical shortcuts because I am a black writer struggling with and through a language that can powerfully evoke and enforce hidden signs of racial superiority, cultural hegemony, and dismissive othering of people and language. So she's saying that, you know, I can't go there because for me as a black writer, she struggles with the language that is used to evoke all this racism. And remember when I mentioned the pen writer at the pen conference of writers that I attended where she was there on a panel with Salman Rushdie? And she said, my job as a black writer is to be a linguistic subversive, a linguistic subversive to this master narrative. Right? Um, so, she said, the kind of work I have always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister, frequently lazy, almost always predictable employment of racially informed and determined change. Okay? Now, do you want me to say that one again? The kind of work I have always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister, frequently lazy, almost always predictable employment of racially informed and determined change. Hmm? The only, and then in parenthesis, she says, and this is crucial for our novel, the only short story I have ever written, Receipts Tuck Teeth, I'll write that out on the board was an experiment in the removal of all racial codes from a narrative about two characters of different races for whom racial identity is crucial. See? The only short story I've ever written was an experiment in the removal of all racial codes from a narrative about two characters of different races for whom racial identity is crucial. She has come back to her first short story in paradise. Really? Okay. This is that. This is one of the Receive Ta Teeth. That's her short story. <clears throat> okay. 
And then finally she says, for reasons that should not need explanation here until very recently and regardless of the race of the author, the readers of virtually all of American fiction have been positioned as white. Hmm. Huh? I am interested to know what that assumption has meant to the literary imagination. When does racial unconsciousness or awareness of race and rich interpretive language, and when does it impoverish you? I'm going to read that's one of my favorite questions. I'm going to read that again. When does racial, quote unquote, unconsciousness or awareness of race enrich interpretive language, and when does it impoverish it? What does positing one's writerly self in the wholly racialized society that is the United States? What does positing oneself as unraced and all the others as race entail? What happens to the writerly imagination of a black author who is at some level always conscious of representing one's own race to or in spite of a re race of readers that understands itself to be universal or race free. Mm -hmm. In other words, how is literary whiteness and literary blackness made and what is the consequence of that construction? So those are the questions that she has taken to Okay. Um, now, uh, so her her way of tackling this this historical talismanic color, what I call talismanic color blindness is to fuse it. Um, And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm um, going to start off, that, that, that I want to go to here, is Kimberly Crenshaw, who we saw in that video last week, was one of the, the feminist law professors. And she has done um, really interesting work, one uh, in a book called The House That Race Built. In that book, she has a chapter called um, Colorblindness, History, and the Law. And she talked about the continuing power and presence of that famous case that I want you guys to look up, so I'm going to write it on the board. Plessy versus Ferguson. Somebody want to talk about that for a minute? Remember what you said it was? Huh? Right. Separate but equal was constitutional and logical, et cetera, et cetera, and within the confines of American law. And Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 was presumably the Supreme Court decision that overturned Plessy. Hmm? It begins the quote unquote thrust for integration, civil rights movement, etc. Brown versus the Board of Education of Kansas, actually. The Kansas Board of Education, something like that. <clears throat> and what Crenshaw says is that Plessy's continuing presence in terms of its formulistic analytics reveals how concepts such as equality can be manipulated. Okay? And Morrison has her own way of challenging this magical or talismanic color blindness that Crenshaw talked about. I'm sorry? Um, okay. Plessy's continuing presence in terms of its 
formalistic analytic reveal then it looks it right that 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 reveals how concepts such as equality can be manipulated. And she goes further and she's talking about how this relates to the denial of racism, that more than anything, this denial of racism and then the situation where we are saying that there's no more need for affirmative action because everything is hunky dory at the end of this century, right? Um, Proposition 200 and all of that good stuff. That what Crenshaw says is that the denial of racism that leads to this kind of colorblind ideology, which she, she calls someplace else colorblind ideology, and she says is connected to capitalism in this, this is me now. I'm going to give you a quote in a minute. This is me. Don't put quotes in my place. Was connected to capitalism and the growth of capitalism in a certain kind of way because it, it, it shows the power of capitalist principles on a culture. And she says, for example, laissez-faire, right? Just let the market forces do their thing, baby, and everything is going to work out. We, we're back to that. But it really, that ideology really takes power at the end of the last century, right? At the end of the last century, with Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. So, uh, laissez-faire has always been the central ideological underpinning, though, of capitalism. That market forces take care of everything. Now, this is the quote, which I think is really important. And I want you to think about, we're not going to really, in questions, you can talk about it. I'm trying to finish this so that we have at least 40 minutes for a discussion. This is Crenshaw. Laissez-faire was to labor what colorblindness is to African mm -hmm. now, I can see that some of you don't know how to spell laissez-faire. I can see that you're doing what I did with the Underground Railroad, which is imagining this giant subway in South North. When you just hear something, <laughs> and I know yeah, that some of you are thinking, lazy fair is like this, right? <laughs> lazy fair? No, it's a trend. Because it's a command. Oh. The other way would be a verb. What does it mean? It means let it be, let it do itself. What do uh, it is let, allow, permit. Laisser, the verb the verb laisser is to let it, let it, let it, allow it, permit it. Faire is to do. So laisser faire is let it be, not lazy faire. <laughs> in other words, when you see this word used in writing some economics, it means let the market forces do their thing. That's what that's what that means. Okay. Um, so laissez there was to labor what color blindness is to African Americans. Oh, uh, I think that's one of the, Crenshaw can be a genius sometimes. And she said, there is no free market of race. Hmm? And I think that that's, the, and she's talking about critical race theory, which we're going to come back to later on. She says, there is no free market of race. There's no free competition. The law has always structured the relationship. Uh, in this in this society, and um, and I think that's really an important point. So anyway, let's let's go back to understanding this colorblindness so that we can make sense of this, because this is also a part of what you see this whiteness that uh, in the literary imagination of Toni Morrison is coming back to in from the earlier novels. Now, paradise, 
that one of the things, this is her way she's trying to um, look at and assess and attack this whole colorblind ideology, um, or uh, this, I call it talismanic colorblindness because it's very magical. It, it makes no sense. And so I think that you'll understand this late affair with the labor with colorblindness is African Americans in a few minutes. And I want to bring that, therefore, up to this current era where um, we see that to, to delegitimize affirmative rights, the conservative thrust or the anti-affirmative action thrust uh, in the, the state and the nation, they have maintained that essentially the major problems of racism are finished. Okay? So that the need to, re to make any repairs, any social or economic repairs, are done with. And what, one of the things that I think is very interesting is how the language of the struggle for equality has been appropriated by the right. Not just that language as it exists on that proposition 200, but this notion of colorblind, colorblind, colorblind is taken from Martin Luther King's very speech, his dream of a colorblind society in which a person would not be judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his or her character. But you have to juxtapose this kind of wishful thinking with the reality of, for example, not just the economic situation that is currently being put into play in the state. And I really recommend you people reading the special that the New York Times is doing that started on Sunday on Does Work Fair Work? Mm -hmm. An amazing series that's going all through the week where they are looking at how the, the whole, some of the, some of slavery is returning, where people are being forced to do the same jobs that last year were done by people with benefits. In um, 1990, but it, it, there was a survey done at, by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, but every year, some place in the country, they've done it again. So it's still valid, even though it was 1990. There was a survey that showed that minority groups were evaluated more negatively on every characteristic, especially blacks and Hispanics who were ranked last or next to last on almost every characteristic. In other words, 56% of the non-blacks rated the intelligence of blacks below that of whites. What I found most horrifying about this survey, which I think is the best one that has been done so far, national survey, was that 30% of black people also rated mm -hmm. blacks negative. 30%. 29.6% to be specific. These ethnic images have remained constant regionally and for all, for all regions and nationally throughout um, the decade. And they determine how people are going to respond in any number of situations. If you have a question, can you sort of... I was just going to ask you, will you say the name of that survey or where we could look? The National it? Opinion Research, um, I don't have it. This is from a paper I wrote. And I don't have the exact um, name. It's ethnic. It's ethnic images. That's what it is. And it's a stir. That's the name of it. It was done in 1990 by Tom Smith. And he there was a research center at the University of Chicago called the National Opinion Research Center, North. And that's where he worked. And that's where these uh, this data comes from. Now. Um, if colorblindness does not exist in the U.S., and if, in fact, people are still judged by what they cannot change on a daily basis, then what purpose does it serve to affirm that we are now a colorblind culture? See? That's the question, and in a sense, that's the question that Toni Morrison also asked. Um, now, here's Crenshaw again, who um, did who I first read doing her deconstruction of colorblindness when she was talking about the O.J. Simpson case. And she says, the gaps between colorblind ideology and the dynamics of racial power 
are nowhere more acute than in the areas of criminal justice, interracial sex, and especially the intersection of the two. Thus, while pundits intoned from the beginning that this would not be a race case, the underlying dynamics that form the material and, and discursive backdrop of the case guaranteed that race would not lay dormant for long. And she calls this, again, French are associated, the erasing of race in order to re-race U.S. society. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? To re-race. In other words, we're going backwards. This thrust towards eliminating race, e-race, and she underlines e and italicizes it, e-race, race. You can't mention it anywhere, right? How many of you, how many of you went to a high school and had the word black, white, ethnicity mentioned in school? You can't mention it. You mention it on a public bus, and people move away, as so though you were taking out a stiletto to clean your fingernails <laughs> on the subway. The minute you start talking realistically about racial situations in the United States, it's seen in public space, it is seen as aggressive. Is that not true? <laughs> but that's a part of this. That's the reason why I think it's talismanic, it's magical. We all follow those stupid rules. You know, we don't mention it in public space. You don't go into the supermarket and talk about anything that is in the newspapers. It is crazy. <laughs> okay, so, um, now, um, I think Terry Tang, who used to write the Seattle Times, had an interesting quote also on colorblindness. She says, colorblindness is espoused by the conservative justices, but they are fixated on race. The thing is, they see only black voters as possessing a racial quality, hmm? close quote. So whiteness is normalcy and naturalized, and, um, and according to some anthropologists, in this case a Kenyan anthropologist named Peter Rippey, he says, the growth of contemporary forms of racism as well as modern sexism <coughs> coincide historically with the maturing of the capitalist mode of production. Yeah. This is Peter Rippey. It is highly significant that the growth of contemporary forms of racism as well as modern sexism coincide historically with the maturing of the capitalist mode of production. Hmm? So that really reproduces laissez-faire for the labor with colorblindness is to African Americans. Okay? So that any in today's world any mention of race is carefully avoided so as to uphold its narrative of freedom and democracy. And above all, it requires a very self-conscious and purposeful non-acknowledgement of difference. Can you repeat the last, which the last part of that racism, sexism? Oh, okay. Sexism Peter Rigby? The growth of contemporary forms of racism as well as modern sexism coincide historically with the maturing of the capitalist mode of production. And we are continuing to mature in horrifying ways. Those of us who live here, I mean, so that they talk about Nations Bank and Bank of America, and that's mm -hmm. going to be the most gigantic Magilla of banking ever. <coughs> and, you know, uh, and the same time, <coughs> the person who, uh, I actually have a friend who does labor work in New York, knows a woman who was downsized out of her job that she'd been in for 18 years, where she had a decent salary of eight and something, I mean, we might not think eight and whatever is deep, but she could live off of them. She was downsized out, had to go on welfare, was forced onto work there, 
and ended up in her old, old job for a dollar something an hour without the benefits, training the person uh, who replaced it. The people who are that together with that's the maturing of capitalism that we are living with today. Okay, that's the maturation process, and that so that all of this kind of goes along with it. Um, okay, I mentioned the whole thing of the, the uh, public space, how the word using the words associated with ethnicity or race in public space will frequently silence speech by people in the immediate vicinity. Indeed, explicit speech within public space may be interpreted as aggressive or threatening. Hmm? So that there's an unreal element about conversation because we don't talk about what's in the newspaper because people attempt to avoid any mention of the obvious. And though these informal and unspoken rules of discourse are followed by the vast majority of people in the nation, whites more often will attest to not having noticed a person's racial category as a way to prove they are not racist. Right? Okay. I mean, this is, this is really, uh, I think, um, an important thing that, that we have to take to uh, paradise. Okay. Um, and and I've, I've been to, what's really interesting is I went to a, a Latin American Studies Association annual meeting in Guadalajara, Mexico last year, and somebody did a really interesting paper about colorblind racism in Guatemala. And so that this, these rules are not national. Rather, it's a part of the globalization of the economy. Mm -hmm. They are international. So that in Guatemala, he said, this, this is Charles Hale, he says there is a colorblind racism in Guatemala that conflates or mixes race and culture, in which a cultural racism says, and, and I've seen this here, the relations between groups is not racial, but it's a question of cultural difference. Haven't you heard that? You see? Or class. Or class. Right, to, to avoid seeing how they are totally intertwined, right? Um, thus, one of the most vociferous proponents of, of this colorblindness affirms that slavery was not racist and that the principal cause of black problem in the U.S. today is the civilization gap. Close quote. Those are his words. That? that exists between black communities and the presumably white suburbs. Dinesh D'Souza uh, in his book, uh, The End of Racism. Uh, hmm? Now, he, I want to be real clear because nobody's going to escape this morning because we want to be really clear. D'Souza represents an essential element in this magical aspect of colorblind ideology. As a person of Indian origin, he joins black conservatives like Glenn Lowry and Ward Connerly who legitimate these analyses that might otherwise be deemed racist. No white person could get away with saying that there's a civilization gap between blacks and the suburbs, who presumably have no black people, right? Okay. Their very brownness and visual persona hmm? enhances and it augments, augments the power of these arguments, validating and producing a kind of colorblind racial power. Right? <clears throat> now here's Ward Connerly, our friend from California who is bringing that stuff to the state of Washington in the, in the form of uh, I-200. Yeah, he's the one who financed the majority of Proposition 209. And right. who has financed Quite a bit of well, he didn't finance it. There are others behind him. He is the brown face who everyone gets on TV to legitimate, to brown or black face, to legitimate it. Mm -hmm. See? And he says, this is Ward Connolly now, 
We've all seen recently the dramatic drop in minority admissions to the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Texas Law School. Institutions that did away with race-based preferences. This shamefully underscores how much race and race alone has been used instead of merit in our halls of higher education. Now, I mean, that is such a simplistic, idiotic statement to say. And what's really interesting, <laughs> this is really interesting. See, is that, oh no, I'm sorry. This came from, this wasn't Connolly. This came from an article that Connolly wrote with Gingrich. Gingrich's name is together. Now, when Angela Gilliam and Erica Reinstein artic, write an article together, if it's co-done, then Gilliam's name is always first because it's alphabetical. And that's how you know that it was jointly done, that it's alphabetical. Or if Reinstein and Gilliam are cited as having written an article together, that means that the vast majority of the piece and the vast majority of the credit goes to Reinstein. And then Gilliam just is there as, because Gil, G comes after R. Okay, well, this is... What if you wrote the article? How would people know if your name would have to be first if you still wrote it? Okay. There's, no There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. Um, but this is Gingrich and Connolly. Now, why do I mention this? This was in the New York Times, this piece, that quote, was part of a, right? Gingrich and Connolly. Uh, Would Gingrich, a conservative politician, have made such an assertion alone? And how does the racial composition of this team, one white, one black, affect the reader's response? Um, I mean, it was a masterpiece of misinformation, this article, because in one place, the California College Admissions Policy will still permit corporate letters of recommendation to influence admissions of elites. I don't know if you know that, but it went to court and it's still okay. In other words, the CEO of a company is still allowed to write a letter of recommendation for um, somebody with C grades, and, and that can push, give them extra points to get in in California. That, that, that's already been resolved. In similar cases, I mean, similarly, the whole question of affirmative action for white men, i.e. vets in the state of Washington, well, that's going to continue. And the vast majority of the recipients of affirmative action have been vets. And in the state of Washington, that is going to continue. That was in Sunday's newspaper. Okay, so it's only this gender and racial aspect that is really threatened in the state of Washington, 100. Okay, now, what I found really interesting hmm, is that uh, and so, Gingrich said in a later piece, a big, huge piece that was done by about him last July or August, after he had done this piece, he said, Gingrich's office, this only proves my point, Gingrich's office only sent him this article for him to peruse and approve when it was too late for him to change anything. And it was basically, he was upset, but he said, my name is on it and I'll stand by it. But I was really not given a chance to change anything and it's really very harsh against uh, affirmative action. So. <laughs> He's such a wuss. I mean, he didn't have the, the nerve to say, you know, I really didn't write this piece. Don't put my blackness there as this mask. <coughs> Minstrelsy. Mm -hmm. Don't use my black face to put this argument out. Right? He didn't want to say that. Instead, he let it go through even though it was not even Gingrich's staff who wrote the piece. And he said as much in the New York Times that the article that came out in the magazine where they're writing about his life and what made him, Ward Connolly, be the kind of person that he is. So this whole issue of um, um, uh, Talismanic um, color blindness and its performative function. It's performed. It is magical. 
It is not just some intellectual, oh, I really don't notice that Vin Adele is Asian. No. It, I mean, for me not to notice that, I am performing in a society that is highly charged racially like this. It is a game I am complicit in. So I refuse to talk, continue with the game, which has made me a very uncomfortable person who people feel very weird about inviting to their parties. <laughs> because I have decided I'm going to use the words white and black and, so, and talk to everybody like I was talking to my family or my friends. If I think this, this is what I'm going to say in public, whatever. I no longer agree to perform talismanic colorblindness. I am not going to use public space that way. And you should see, oh, it's just, it's, I, I should write an article just on the things that happen. When I just use the words white and black or whatever, or, oh, I just think, um, you know, beyond the whiteness of whiteness is this wonderful book. And I said that to one of the secretaries on the campus. <laughs> and they kind of, you know, I, you, you know, just broken a rule. What do I say? <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen to this? She has used the word whiteness and she's black. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> you know? Well, that happened to me as a doctor too, though, because I was at the doctor's about uh, something I thought was a migraine, and he asked me what I was studying. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm thinking black feminist thought, and he was like, uh -huh. Like he totally changed the subject and just looked like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's bad enough white feminist thought, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last thing that I want before we get into our questions, um, and I know you want a break, but I just wanted to say that, um, and we will be coming back to this because of, <laughs> you want a break, Jen? Oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this whole question of the black church and how the gender, you see, how women have, um, black women have related to the church where they are often the, and for many churches, the bodies who go, they're the ones who support the patriarchy of the church. Mm -hmm. The conservative of some of the churches, not all churches. And some of the churches in the Seattle area are wonderfully, uh, like Robert Jeffrey's church and so on, you know, wonderfully um, involved in global politics and, and so on and so forth. But I think this whole question is best described most sensitively by a play that I saw where you just, it, it went so deep. These were in the days of the 60s when you could really see really poignant things written by blacks on the stage and so on. And the Negro Ensemble Company did wonderful things. And one of them was The Sty of the Blind Pig. And The Sty of the Blind Pig, I think, was written by Douglas Turner Ward, who was also one of the directors at this, at this theater. And I took my parents to see it. And um, you have to understand that my dad was raised as a holiness in Oklahoma. And my, my mother said, my kids aren't, and she was raised a Baptist, and she says, you know, that, that emotional stuff, that's, you know, her thing was that that was too, that was in some territory she did not want to tread for her kids, and she wanted something kind of white or getting close to it, like congregational. And she also wanted to get out of the South for the same reason. So they went to Boston and we were raised congregational. And I always felt cheated because my friends could sit down to the piano and take any song and put that church in it. And I took piano lessons for years and can't do that. Right? I, I, felt, I have always felt that I lost something very vital from that. But in any event, this whole emotional aspect to this church thing comes out in this way, as well as the gender. This mother and the daughter, they're living together, and um, the mother constantly says to her 40-year-old, never been married, sister, uh, daughter, um, I'll, I'll knock you into the middle of next week, or I'll bat your two eyes into one, you ain't too grown for me, you know, and she's old and feeble, and she says these expressions that um, you hear all to the South. I love those expressions. <laughs> 
And um, uh, in any event, <laughs> they both go to, uh, uh, as I would call it, different churches, but they, they're both in domestic work. Yeah. <laughs> they're both made. And uh, the only thing that the daughter really gets out of life is that she writes the obituary column for Frances Foster. For those of you who know the theater, you know Frances Foster is a killer actress. She played this daughter. And um, she writes the obituary column for her church. And um, some blind, full of brush man or whatever, comes to the door and she's talking about this obituary she has to write for somebody. And how Foster did this, I'll never know how she did it. But she talks, starts talking about this guy she used to know in high school. And he kind of like, sort of acted like maybe he might have liked her. And um, they just go their different paths. And now it's her job to write his obituary. And um, her voice goes into that cadence of the, the black church, you know, that rhythm. And somehow it moves to where she's on the floor in an orgasm. And you just saw it because this fusion of black women, the church, and living through God to satisfy so many emotional issues is just in this one scene, just clumped together. And it just hits you in the orchestra pit, you know. And I think that that is the best, the sky of the blind pig. That, to me, really, it summed up for me the, the contradictions that I experienced or felt about the church and the reason why I never wanted to be involved in it. Because also what comes through is the fact that this woman, I mean, that she's not alone and that there's so many women in this church and that these women are the ones who provide the Cadillac or the preacher or whatever. And it's a whole issue that I think is, is a very uh, um, crucial one, uh, and yet it's so sensitive that I don't think black feminist thought could ever go there. They ha it has to be inclusive. It cannot go into that space where you open up that door of the interlocking intersection. You understand? I think it's a very complicated door to open. So I think that what Toni Morrison is doing, in a way, is that she is taking on that patriarchy of the church in a very definite way. Now, that's, are there any questions, conversation, you want to run to the bathroom, come back, and have 30 mm -hmm. minutes of, 30 minutes of uh, discussion, questions, observations? Mm -hmm. Female preachers who um, are quite popular, who challenge this note, this whole patriarchal, the patriarchal assumptions and setup and arrangements of the traditional black church, but they are still a minority. The vast majority of people who go to church in this country worship within the confines of patriarchy, which means you know, uh, the, the uh, black, the, the, at least the figurehead, the pre preacher as the leadership figurehead is still male. Notwithstanding the fact that there are lots of arenas within a church, a black church, or any church, where women have power and authority. That's also true. But the whole question of um, the center of a church as the central symbol of a church being the minister or pastors who um, minister to their flock, that is male in the black church. Now, uh, and the community basically has supported, they have supported that structure and they take that structure with them and they took that structure of worship to the black towns or any place where they went. Do you think that changed during the civil rights movement at all? 
What what changed? It's like um, I yesterday I watched a film called The Songs of Free, which was like a Bill Moyers basically an interview and documentary about when he talked to Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He found his sweetheart in the rock, and um, she was talking about how when she was involved in the civil rights movement, like for the first time she was seeing a lot of women in the pulpit, and a lot of women like getting up who were members of the church that she hadn't really seen before, and that that was like a really huge turning point for her as like you know she was coming with AIDS during that time, and she was also seeing this transformation within the church and in the civil rights movement, I see these women get up in the pulpit and be really taking on a lot more leadership, and she said that changed a lot mm -hmm. in the civil rights movement. I would say that it certainly began a change, but that still the vast majority of people worship in, ch in churches that are dominated by men, or at least in which the central figure is male. But I think that quite possibly you could say that it is within the African American community where there are more seriously considered women preachers. I, I, I think that possibly percentage-wise that might be true. Well, I mean, that's one of those issues where, you know, there is considerable uh, conflict and disagreement and some, and, and also sort of, it's, um, <laughs> it's not really, you have to see it in terms of the thrust to um, sterilize certain women of color, like Puerto Rican women, Native American women, certain poor black women in the South. You have to see the whole fact that because of those excesses by either government or private forces vis-a-vis -vis women, that a lot of black people see, you know, sometimes abortion or birth control as a kind of genocide. Um, at the same time, the pressure about having children and being an unwed mother is totally, you know, it's totally different. And for as long as I have been looking at statistics, the statistics have always said that something like 90% of the black teens who get pregnant have their kids, and 90% of the white teens who get pregnant have abortion. I mean, that that was like when abortion was illegal. That was the statistic, um, the approximate statistic that the um, Guttmacher Institute, for example, in New York would put out. And I don't think that has really changed a lot. The way the approach of the black community to children, which stems back to slavery and to the fact that you raise, you know, that you keep your children, has been a very powerful narrative and the church, the church's approach has been reflected in and around those facts, whether historical or uh, in terms of different approaches to what happens when you get pregnant. So, um, you have to put those two together. Abortion goes together with how does the community respond to. And like, um, <clears throat> around two or three years ago in the New York Times, there was a woman saying, uh, writing an op-ed piece, a conservative woman writer, we have to bring back the concept of shame. You know? <laughs> Uh, for whom and for what, and and uh, that's the kind of a, you know, that's part of the reason why I think the abortion, the reproductive rights issue takes on these different characteristics for blacks and whites, for black women and white women. Does that answer your question? Can you elaborate a little bit on the concept of shame and why we the concept of shame. Young, unwed, teen mothers. Well, I, I'm definitely against um, unwed teen mothers having to bear shame with unwed teen fathers going free. I mean, that's where we begin. <laughs> that, that is absolutely where we begin. 
there's not so much the teen fathers going free as long as society does not allow for people to have fuller lives and options and jobs, then people make decisions about what I can give myself and my future based often on these, you know, truncated possibilities. But I mean, um, uh, I think it's, it's not all right that somebody who's wealthy is able to be a Madonna and have a child and not be wed, or an Angela Gilliam, I was also unwed. But I had a college degree. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? I, mean, I don't know. I just think that the promotion of, um, especially with black, young black communities, you know, like why they keep having children is something that I think is a black community needs to work on. Because it's not that they don't want to have children, but it's just that they don't want to have children. And they don't want to have children. I, I agree, but shame is not the road. It's someplace else. You start with options, choices, education, education of boys about gender relations, different models of adulthood, different models of definitions of masculinity, such as those that the capitalist system generates, a definition of masculinity that is totally sick. White men have it, black men have it. Everybody here gets a definitions of gender and appropriate gender relationships that are really quite unsavory, I think, in our society. And you have to struggle through and around and over them to reach something healthy. And a lot of people do. You know, a lot of people do. But I don't think shame, that is, um, I've done something wrong. I am unclean. I am not right. I have done something immoral. That is what shame embodies. And that is not what I think you take to a young girl who's gotten herself into the situation for whatever reason. I mean, that's just my position. I think the shame is awful. And it's connected to some kind of Christian religious something or other, something or other back with Mali as Malafakaram in the 15th century. <laughs> and it just has no place in 21st. That education, yes. And telling children or asking a child, do you, you know, want a baby because it's something you would control in your life? Well, here is an idea of some other way you can control your life. <clears throat> I mean, that's just different. I just don't think shame is it. I think, yeah, the reason why I was going to ask you about that is because my 18-year-old sister has three months to live with that. That's not what I'm saying. And she has to have a child. No, she didn't. Yeah, she didn't. Well, well, okay. <laughs> she, uh, she, she did not was... get herself pregnant. Okay. okay. Neither did Mary. Excuse me, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, <laughs> I was inquiring about that. Um, we all had these big plans for her. Like, you know, when I was her age, my mother scared me out of that. She basically told me that she delayed until she would get married. So I was, I was, I was good. Kind of, you know, <laughs> but I remember when she told me that this happened a week and a half ago, and she told me on the phone, the first thing I said out of my mouth was, you're statistic out of your statistic. And I, I pretty much made her feel shameful. And I just had to rethink, and I've been having mixed feelings about it because it doesn't happen to our family. Like, this is just something that doesn't happen to me. This is not my baby sister who's supposed to go to college and have this wonderful life, and I basically told her that she's not going to have a life anymore because she thinks she's with child at 18. But I had to rethink, you know, what I said to her. And I just, I was just inquiring about how you felt, like, how it made me decide. I'm still like kind of struggling with how I should really feel. I'm, I'm highly disappointed. And I do feel like she's a statistic. She just, I don't know, she fell into the game. No. I, I don't know. Can I come in? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was in the same situation as this was. I was 18. I was just a senior in high school. Well, actually, I was 19. But being that I was the oldest grandchild, and everybody had such high expectations. My father used to brag, oh yeah, she graduated from high school. I'm going to buy her this, and she was going to get married, she's going to have the biggest Martin's wedding, and da, da 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 And here I go, and I get pregnant. The first thing he says to me, uh, he doesn't even ask, he says, we're going to take care of nobody going to die. But I couldn't do that. The reason being, I couldn't do that is because 
my mother is my told you know <laughs> but I've always been raised that way and, and it was something I felt that I would not be able to deal with. Even though I knew I was wrong for doing what I did, it was something that I said to myself, well if I do this, am I going to be able to do it with the fact that, you know, I'm a bored child or whatever, even though I was young. But I was determined to prove my father wrong. And by doing so, I finished high school on time. I may have been late in getting my associate's degree, but I do have goals, and I'm going. And I feel that I am going to prove to everybody in my family that I can still succeed. And I think that if you have that mindset, you know, I see what you're saying. You're saying that your sister is not statistical. You know. And I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying the media is right, but it's just like I'm just trying to break out of that. Right, but you know what? You're only that way if you feel that you're, or if you make yourself that way. You see what I'm saying? I could have been that way. I could say, oh well. I'm not going to drop out of school, you know, get on welfare, do whatever. But I don't, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, nobody, everybody, my mother has a nursing degree, my aunt has a PhD, everybody in my family is educated. I'm not going to be, I don't want to be talked about and shamed on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So therefore, you know, it, it's even pushing me hard, even though I'm very years old, you know, I'm still trying to get my degree. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I'm sorry for what I said. You're not going to be a statistic because that's just language people use to make people think that they don't count. Mm. Huh? I feel horrible about that. I feel like people can go about what they want. Yeah, I feel really horrible about that. No, just go back and, and say, you know, give her a hug and say, and, and, and say, I'm here to support you and whatever you decide, I'm with you. Yeah. I wish that my mother was scared that I was scared of that. No. Oh, man. But the scare, now that's an important thing. Because, um, you know, my grandmother told me stories that took me years to get out of my head. You don't, you don't, the, the fear is also not the way to go. My mother was a teen mother, and she was so concerned about, she didn't want to follow that track. So I did everything opposite. And she's going to be fine. Yeah. Well, I think, oh, well, I was just going to say, that thinking about the class and thinking about the autobiography and stuff too, is like understanding that there's a context for everything and that there's such a fine line between holding ourselves and our family and our community responsible and knowing also how to hold society at large responsible. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, and that there are things that we can do about that, you know? Like volunteer plans. Do, you know, not the time is great, but like, do, you know, I mean, I, you're busy enough already. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm not trying to be a work from home. Yeah. I'm not I told my sister about four positions. She was like, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be afraid. I go, you're going to work. Three jobs. You're going to work. She was kind of scared about that. But see, this is, and, and Cynthia has brought up an extremely important point, which uh, I, I think really. Uh, is a part of um, this whole question of, you know, uh, this quote by, um, what's her name, but that laissez-faire mm -hmm. is to labor as um, colorblindness is to African-American community. Because what she has done, this is Cindy, she's reflecting on this conflict that really has been kind of like a division between capitalist ideology and how you, and social science, and socialism, where there's some kind of government responsibility and for the public sphere, which um, is collective and shared, and which which influences our lives and consciousness. Whereas we're moving towards eliminating any government responsibility, we're going towards privatization, and saying privatization and saying this is all an individual problem. See what I'm saying? Joblessness or Teenage person, it's them. It's some kind of individual failure. And this is one of the things that really was quite nice about socialism, is the recognition that the individual doesn't create society, right? But it's this collective that creates the individual. Now that's an aspect of socialism I absolutely refuse to give up ever, 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 ever. 